I'm going to have to have my notes here, but later on at the end, I'm hoping to finish a little bit early so that you'll have a chance to have a look at some of the things um, around here, some of these um, lithographs of birds. Out on the table outside, George brought along um, some facsimile copies of uh, Sylvester's books that were, and these facsimiles were made in about 1989. So um, you'll, you'll be able to handle those ones, whereas the historical stuff here, I think George is happy if you come look and he'll handle it because it's, it's very precious, obviously, belongs in, in his family history. All right, so let's find out about Sylvester. Here he is, here's the man himself, looking very old. stern, someone said very old. <laughs> so Sylvester was a scientist. He was a naturalist in every sense of the word. And he resided in Brisbane, or it was Moreton Bay when he came along, uh, from 1854 until his death in 1880. Now, he's variously been called the Birdman of Brisbane, as in this Sunday Mail magazine, which was advertising an exhibition of his work at Brisbane's Antiquarian Print Gallery. And he's had a few books written about him, which I'll refer to. Um, this man here, Dr. Louis Piggott, which is the second book that was written about him, calls him Australia's answer to John Gould. And I'm sure all of you would know who John Gould is, but we're going to talk about John Gould down the track. The other one that I've used a lot is this one. Um, it's three books and a CD. And it, this was the first publication really about Sylvester. It's called Diggles Down Under. And I think it was published in about 2001 by uh, Dr. Rod Dr. Fisher yeah, yeah. and the Brisbane History Society. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so this is Sylvester Diggles. Let's have a look. I thought that before I began, I'd give you an overview of the things that he was both interested in and very productive in, in early Brisbane. And I'm not going to talk about all those today because there are far too many to cover. But you'll notice that the, the main interest, the main thing that he's known for is his ornithology, but he's equally been very clever in the area of entomology. He had a, a great interest in astronomy and he was probably a, a Brisbane's first actual photographer. But quite apart from all that, the rest of his life, I don't know how he had the hours in the day, but this was amazing. He was a musician of some renown, wasn't he, George? Um, he, did, he instructed at schools, he composed, he accompanied, he performed. He did all those things. And he made his bread and butter, really, from tuning pianos and other musical instruments. He was into art. He taught art and music at two of the Brisbane schools in his time. Religion was, was pretty important in his life, as it was for most people in those days. And he was a foundation member of the Queensland Philosophical Society, which was Queensland's first scientific body. Now, this society was actually the group that got together and said, we really need a museum in Brisbane. And um, so Sylvester was out there in the forefront with with other members of that group, and they managed to get Brisbane a little museum. So, so he's been fairly important in all that early stuff in Brisbane. So you would wonder, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about his family history. He was born, as you saw, in 1817. He was the eldest son of an ironmonger called Edward, and an ironmonger, of course, was a hardware merchant. He was born in Liverpool, by the way, I might have left that bit out. Um, Edward and Elizabeth. Elizabeth's uh, surname, her maiden name, was Sylvester. Hence his Christian name, Sylvester, with the I and not the Y. Um, so, as we said earlier, he's, he's George's direct ancestor and he's my uncle. <laughs> but I claim him anyway. <laughs> he's done all the work. <laughs> <laughs> So how does the son of an ironmonger learn all these skills, gain all this knowledge, you might wonder. So we think that most likely he, he trained here at the Liverpool Mechanics Institute. What was the Liverpool Mechanics Institute? 
Uh, he also read widely, as did his father. He, he kept detailed scrapbooks and sketchbooks, and some of them are still in the hands of the family. If you look along at the end of the table here, uh, propped up on the table is a, del a delightful little sketchbook that you can have a little look at later on. But that, that one came with him on the voyage to Australia. So he did all of these things before he came to Australia. Um, and we think that he probably learnt his art and lithography here at the Liverpool Mechanics Institute. And I'll just say something about Mechanics Institutes because they seem to spring up all around Great Britain, Scotland, um, and other parts of the world in the 1820s and the 1830s. And they were seen to be, um, by giving evening lectures, they were seen to be catering for the working man. So people could go along in the evening and learn about their favourite topic. Um, but they also provided libraries, affordable libraries. Other than that, you had to have a bit of money to be able to go to a library. So the affordable libraries and even museums were provided at mechanics institutes. Uh, this particular one apparently housed a natural history room that was said to be crowded, and I'm quoting here from Dr. Rod Fisher, he said it was crowded with entomological, ornithological specimens, as well as mineralogical and geological specimens. So there were lots of opportunities for Sylvester to uh, increase his skills and his knowledge. Now, Pete and I went to find the Liverpool Mechanics Institute two years ago when we were in England, and we discovered that it's been sort of consumed into the whole Liverpool arts um, campus. We were actually allowed to go inside. Uh, it was closed at the time, but we, we managed to get in. You'll notice, if you look here, that since Sylvester, there've been a couple of other more, imp or quite important um, people who've studied there, uh, namely John Lennon and Paul McCartney. So this is the Paul McCartney Auditorium and apparently he does provide a fair bit of funding towards um, uh, scholarships and the like at, at what's now the Liverpool Arts Camp Campus. Now you probably recognise these two, John Gould and his wife Elizabeth. Um, they uh, preceded Sylvester in their study of birds and they went all over the world and they created many books about birds of other countries. So they um, were doing their thing, I guess, uh, when Sylvester was a young man. Um, John Gould, he was the uh, taxonomist who was given Charles Darwin's finches to study and look at. Um, so John Gould, he was the taxonomist at that stage for the Zoological Society of London. He had to examine and label the specimens. So this was really and truly the era of the naturalist. And I've read that naturalists really have been described as the first geeks in their pursuit of new and unusual specimens from all over the world. So John and Elizabeth Gould came to Australia. They spent 18 months here collecting birds, bird specimens. Um, and then they went back to England and created Birds of Australia by 1848. They had that published. Um, and they then paid collectors to continue to send specimens back to England. But interestingly, what I've read about John Gould is this, that, that people said that he was in fact a hard-nosed commercial ornithologist, and some would say that he could hardly draw. But he actually gathered some really good artists around him, and one of them was of course his wife Elizabeth. She was an excellent artist. She drew many of the bird specimens. Another one that you might have heard of is Edward Lear of uh, children's book fame, The Owl and the Pussycat Man. Okay, so that's the Goulds. So in 1839, Sylvester married. He married a lady called Eliza Bradley. And at that time, he recorded his profession as a miniature artist uh, and drawing and music teacher. 
Now I'm going to show you a painting up there on the screen, but George is just going to hold up the actual little mini miniature because this is still in the hands of the family. It's actually called A Colourful Bow of Birkenhead, but it's thought to be Sylvester's self-portrait. So he hasn't actually said that's what it is, but that's what it's considered to be. So he was a miniature artist. He, he um, painted portraits for people. And of course, all of those skills would stand him in good stead later on when he was depicting birds and caterpillars and moths and butterflies. So his skills as a miniature artist were, were an important acquisition. And in fact, um, I, I've wondered why, why did he come to Australia? What, what caused him to up, you know, uproot the whole family because by then there were three children as well and make the journey to Australia. And the only clue that we have about that is that he wrote to my direct ancestor, his younger brother, competition drove me away and I never regret the day and certainly would never return to stay. And we think that that competition was probably this new skill of photography. So photography was coming along and taking over from the miniaturists because it was much faster and much more accurate and so on. So it was in 1853 and he was aged 37 with a wife and three children. They sailed to Australia to see what life would be like and they sailed on board a little ship called the Willem Ernst. And all the way out here he kept this little sketchbook. So this is a photograph of something in the sketchbook here. He sketched what was on the deck. And he also sketched everything he could along the way. So here we're seeing his growing interest in the natural sciences. And he's finding um, sea creatures, seabirds and so on, and he's examining them carefully and writing and recording about them. So this was the head of an albatross. Um, obviously these were shot as they went along on the journey. Do you think they were used for food, George? What do you think? I no idea? No? Why would they shoot an albatross? Just to have a look at it, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. That's, I know, it is what they did, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So as they came to Australia, he used his microscope, he loved looking and teaching his children about science. Um, but he also records scanning the heavens with his telescope and he delighted in his first view of uh, the Southern Cross. Now if you want to see that telescope, Sylvester's telescopes, telescopes, George has actually donated it now, it was in your possession George, to the Commissariat. Commissariat so. Museum. Yeah. So that's in Brisbane, you can go along and have a look, there's a little display about Sylvester there. Whoops, I'm just going to go back a slide. Okay, so he arrives in Sydney late in 1853. Quickly found himself a job, a piano tuning job with a, with a large Pitt Street company there. And then during the next year he has to make a trip to Brisbane to tune pianos. So he comes up on the ship to tune pianos and goes as far as Ipswich which of course might have been the capital of Queensland, but didn't, didn't make it. Now you, so then he quickly decides that this looks like a pretty good place, you know, there's no one here doing what he does, so maybe there's opportunity here in Moreton Bay. So at that point, after the piano tuning, he goes back to Sydney, packs up the family and arrives in Moreton Bay. And he arrives there in late 1854. Now we have to remember that the Moreton Bay colony then had not too long ago been a, a, con, a convict settlement for the very worst offenders from New South Wales had come up here. So only for about, you know, probably about 15 years free settlers have been encouraged to come and live here. So he puts this advertisement in the uh, Moreton Bay Courier to announce his arrival in Brisbane. 
and he's going to be teaching piano forte. He's going to be teaching singing and drawing in a variety of styles. And he'll also do the tuning and regulating of your pianos and other musical instruments. And if you have a look down the bottom there, you'll see that he can also do miniature likenesses in a variety of styles. So I'm thinking he's ready to, to, to create a miniature for you or take your photograph because this is where he begins to dabble in photography. And if you have a look at the address, I love it, Elizabeth Street, nearly behind the store of Mr Skyring. <laughs> I guess that's the Mr Skyring that, that the road's named after, not too far from here. Mm. So that's how he's going to make a living for the family. Um, now, when he came to Brisbane, he can't keep the sketching pencil out of his hand. So he begins, he's actually depicted in this little book here, um, scenes of the coastline as he comes up on the ships and also as he came out to Australia. You'll find the Glasshouse Mountains depicted there. Uh, however, they're a little bit small, so I didn't put them up, but what I have got here are some images of his that are of early Brisbane, and I thought you might be interested in seeing those before we jump to his scientific work. So here we have the North Brisbane Hotel. Owned by Edward Bond, it's thought that perhaps he might have stayed here initially when he first arrived. The hotel faced Queen Street between Edward and Albert Streets. I love this one. This is Fortitude Valley, looking up Anne Street. So here, on the hill, is the priest's house, and, and that was right near where All Hallows Girls School was built and still is today. So we're looking up Anne Street from Fortitude Valley, where Sylvester and the family did live for a period of time. And you know, a couple of... Aboriginal people there just having a rest in the shade. This one is a, a view of North Brisbane from the south done in 1858. Uh, we're looking towards North Quay and William Street and we're, we're seeing here the military barracks, uh, St John's Church and the Evangelical Church and here in the forefront the commissariat store and Queen's Wharf. Yes, the commissariat store is still there. You can still go and visit and have a tour of the commissariat store. Now, eventually the Diggles family settled in Kangaroo Point. So here we are looking up Main Street, Kangaroo Point, in 1858. So they actually had a home in Wharf Street, which we're going to have a look at. And I was delighted George has got the real photograph up there, which I didn't know until today, which is great. But this is Waterview Cottage, and eventually this is where the Diggles family settled. Uh, it's in Wharf Street, Kangaroo Point. Wharf Street just runs off Main Street. Um, and they lived there from 1857. Now, Sylvester was very proud of this house. Um, he was also very interested in styles of houses to suit the tropical climate of Queensland. And he was a member of something called the Acclimatisation Society in Brisbane. Um, so you'll see that his house has the wide verandas and the high roof and all that sort of thing. This particular photo, it's thought, was taken around about um, the turn of the century. So obviously he's sadly dead and gone by then. And these would be members of the family, but we, we can't identify any of them, can we, George? So um, this was their home. When he wrote to my ancestor, his younger brother, he said, the only dear thing here in Australia is rent. So, but you can easily own a home, he said, because I belong to a building society. And you know, you just put in a few shillings a week and you end up being able to own your own home. And I would encourage you to come to Australia and try your luck. And I'm really happy to say that George decided to do that. <laughs> okay, so just going back to his areas of interest again, just momentarily, I'm going to start off talking about astronomy. That's going to be the first thing. That was just a little sidelight to his life. 
you imagine fitting this all around, you know, going on the piano tuning trips and teaching the art and the music and all the rest of it. So we're going to have a look first of all at astronomy. And the first person I'm going to introduce you to here is Captain Henry O'Reilly. Now Captain O'Reilly, he was a steamship captain and ultimately he um, established his own steamship company with quite a number of ships. But Sylvester had actually come up to Brisbane with Captain O'Reilly the first time he came. So they made acquaintance with each other and they discovered that they were both um, interested in astronomy. Now, Captain O'Reilly is, is said to be a bit of a, a darling of the ladies now, I, of Brisbane. I don't know why that is, but apparently it had to do with the fact that he, he was the man who'd bring up all the things they needed for the household and the nice new dress fabrics and all that sort of thing. Captain O'Reilly actually had a house where Cloudland was built. It was called O'Reilly's Hill. Um, and it, he also had his own observatory and that was in Felix Street and down near the river. So Sylvester would go along regularly and together they would do their, their astronomical observations and Sylvester writes in his diary that, that they've finished mapping the moon's surface. So he's very proud of the fact that they've done that. Um, now, we're going to jump forward to 1871. 1871 was an important year for astronomers in Australia because there was going to be a total solar eclipse. And it would only be seen from far north Queensland, off Cape York. So for about two years, the astronomers in Victoria and New South Wales have been madly planning to acquire a ship somehow or other to take them up there. They were, they were buying new equipment from England, the latest up-to-date telescopes, photography equipment and so on. They were getting all this gathered together so that they could have an expedition for this solar eclipse. So the Queensland Government actually provided the ship for this. So the Queensland Government said, well, we've got to have somebody on this expedition because we're providing you with the Governor Blackall, the ship. So they invited Captain O'Reilly to, um, to go and he had to decline because he was too busy with his shipping company. But he said, why don't you ask my friend Sylvester Diggles because he's also an artist and a naturalist. So maybe he'd go. Well, Sylvester jumped at the chance. So Sylvester was on the 1871 Eclipse Expedition. And the expedition went right up to near a place called Cape Sidmouth in far north Queensland. And this is, have you seen this one before, George? Yeah. Never. <laughs> I found this one. Um, this is his watercolour of the ship, the Governor Blackall, and the tents set up on what was later called Eclipse Island off Cape Sidmouth in far north Queensland. Now, I think I've got a picture. And this one? Yeah. So here's Sylvester sitting here beside this giant telescope and outside of the tents. Now the tents were, um, they had the, the New South Wales tents and the Victorian tents. And inside the tents all their photographic equipment was set up. And they were hoping that during the course of the eclipse, during the, the time they had available, that they'd be able to develop 20 exposures during that brief period of the eclipse. So they were all set up there already. Now, they took quite some time to get up to North Queensland. Um, and they had, they debated along the way, well, you know, perhaps we should set up another observation point, not just rely on one observation point. So in the end they decided they wouldn't because they had the option of another, perhaps another um, island or the mainland. In the end they decided against both of those and concentrated all their efforts on this one little island. And of course it happened in December this eclipse expedition and you can guess what happened can't you? It rained and they could see nothing. So it was very disappointing for the astronomers and even more so that night when this little ship arrived, it was um, one of those little boats that goes up and down the coast with supplies at the time, it was called the Matilda. 
The Matilda arrived and they were talking to the sailors and the uh, captain and they'd been 38 kilometres north of there on another little island called Night Island. Um, we'll just have a look at where that is. Okay, so this is the path of the eclipse. You can see up there at the top, Eclipse Island and Night Island. Night Island was 38 kilometres north. And they described the solar eclipse. <laughs> and all these astronomers said, no, 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 you didn't see that. But by the time they'd finished listening to the explanation, they realised, yes, they had actually seen the solar eclipse. 38 kilometres further north, they'd actually seen the whole thing and these guys had missed out. Very, yeah. However, the naturalists didn't miss out. There are a number of naturalists on this trip and they loved it. They loved what they did and they loved what they saw. Diggles wrote um, about this. He actually wrote a report about it all after the event and they were far more successful. So here's um, the entomology coming to the fore. Here's Sylvester recording what he collected up the top there and regretting that he lost this brilliant green Suetonia aurata. Uh, I think he would regret that, wouldn't he? Because have a look at it. He said, I had it in the net and it got away. Um, but he did collect, he collected some parasites and he sent them on down to his friend Gerard Kreft in Sydney. He'd actually spent a few days with Gerard Kreft before he boarded the governor Blackall and they were great mates. Gerard Kreft, I'm sure some people will know that name, um, he was, he was in charge of the Sydney or, or then the Australian Museum. Kreft then went on to uh, publish papers about the creatures. And, and there was a conchologist called Brazier on the expedition and he named that little shell there for Diggles. Hmm. Okay, so that's his interest in astronomy. Just, just a little side interest for him. So now we're going to talk about his interest in entomology. And, and he loved this and he did a lot of work in this area. Um, now this lady here is Dr Elizabeth or Pat Marks, she was known as. She was a leading Queensland entomologist and a malaria expert. And she was the first person to revive an interest in Sylvester Diggles. Because in 1962 she gave the C.T. White Memorial Lecture to the Royal Society of Queensland. Did you know this lady, Cecily? Yes, Cecily's nodding, she did know this lady. She was very important in, in Brisbane and Queensland. Mm -hmm. So the talk was called Sylvester Diggles, a Queensland naturalist 100 years ago. And she said in the talk that she believed that his contribution to early entomology in Queensland rivaled that of his ornithological work. So I'm actually going to read from her talk some memories that are given by a man called Charles Melton. Now Charles Melton was a, um, a newspaper journalist but in his early days when he was a child he loved natural history and sometimes he'd go wandering with Sylvester Diggles and he wrote about it here. So we have some memories recorded and this is what he said. Charles Melton recalled that when he was a lad he frequently met Diggles on the Annerley Ridges. So if you know Brisbane you know where Annerley is. In quest of natural history specimens and Diggles when he saw a butterfly with a fleet wing often handed his neck to the boy, that's Charles, uh, with a request to capture it. A Saturday afternoon tramp with him through the bush between Woolongabba and Annerley or through the vine scrubs at Fairfield was an intellectual treat. So that's what Charles Melton had to say. Sylvester wrote of collecting Syra Australis on Banksias at the German station. And if you know history, you'll know that's Nanda. Yep. Uh, and some of the most interesting beetles he found floating on wood when the Brisbane River was in flood. And Miss Nell Brown said that her mother, Mrs. D.L. Brown, spoke of his visits to the Browns property, which was in the vicinity of Murray Street at Wilston. And he would come there to tune the piano and he would spend the rest of the day bug hunting. <laughs> and I, I believe he often found bugs in the pianos too, so he, he sort of studied those as well. Um, so 
So it's evident that his interest ranged further than merely just making collections. Some people of that era were a bit like, oh, well, let's collect every single um, bug that we possibly can and pin it down and, and have it there on display. But not Sylvester. His interest was more than catching and classifying and pinning. And he collected many of the specimens himself, especially whilst he was on piano tuning trips. He used to go up to Ipswich, he'd go to Toowoomba, he went to the Darling Downs and so on, which was, I guess he got there by ship or boat. That's the way he traveled. Um, he also exchanged widely with others in Australia. He had acquaintances in all the capitals, in Adelaide, in Melbourne and so on, that he exchanged with. Uh, and by the end of his life, he had a great many display cases and he'd had one purposely built. Um, and he either sold them or donated them to the, the new Queensland Museum. And he even had an entire genre of moths given the name Diggleseer although it has a different synonymous name now. So these papers, I mentioned the Queensland Philosophical Society earlier, they used to meet once a month in Brisbane and someone would deliver a paper of something of scientific interest. These were the ones that he uh, delivered regarding insects. He was very interested in a lot of things there. You'll notice the butterflies on host plants, which was something people hadn't really given much thought to. Um, and most of the papers were then published in the local press for people to read. So in a little um, sketchbook here, he always notes what the, host, what the plant was that he found the creature um, or their butterfly laying its eggs on or whatever. And he often spent time just um, um, watching, a bit like you, Anoop. He just sat and watched uh, to see what the butterfly would land on. And if it landed on a plant that was new to Australia, in other words, something that had been brought in, he would puzzle over that and he would think, well, I wonder what native plant might have attracted this butterfly to lay its eggs. Um, you know, now it's laying on this imported plant, but I wonder what native plant was its host. Um, So that was something he, he was puzzling over. Now, this uh, Dr. Marx again. Oh, sorry, I wanted to show you a few of the sketches from his sketchbook. They are really stunning. When you get up close to them, you can see how beautiful they are. You can see on this one here that he was collecting and, and recording from the time he arrived in 1855. He kept going on that. He puzzled over them. He kept them in the backyard. He kept them everywhere and he really studied them their whole life cycle to, to make sure he knew all about them. Um, and you'll recognise this one, of course, the lava and chrysalis of the wanderer butterfly. Um, and I'll just read to you what Dr. Marx said about that. He was interested in the question of native insects feeding on introduced plants. The Courier report in the paper in 1871, his, his report called on introduction to insects, contains the first record of the wanderer butterfly in Australia and he gave its acclimatisation as an illustration of the practicability of introducing insects to control the various foreign plants that were overrunning the country. He must thus have been one of the earliest to suggest biological control of weeds in Australia. And he was also the first to actually um, note, to depict and talk about the, the wanderer butterfly having made its way here to Australia. And then finally, George will get a surprise with this one. Yeah. I was trailing around the internet and I found this delightful piece of jewellery, a one-off piece of jewellery. And it's a Hercules moth. So in, in a modern twist to the story, I stumbled across the website of a Brisbane goldsmith and jeweller and designer uh, called Michael Hoffmeyer. And he'd come across Sylvester Diggle's insect illustrations of moths and butterflies and also of birds. He was inspired to make some one-off um, pieces of jewellery uh, and this is one of them. So if you have a look, he found the moth with a wingspan of 150 millimetres, particularly captivating and his brooch, this brooch, has a wingspan of about half of that size and he's also created pieces 
uh, inspired by the birds. So it's something new to find about Sylvester every time you go on the net. Yeah, he is amazing. So, okay, now we're going to talk about the ornithology of Australia. And this was Sylvester's crown and glory. You've had a look at some of his work around the room and outside. Um, so I'd like to, to tell you how that all came about. So although John Gould had created his comprehensive uh, a publication called, and his was called The Birds of Australia, its cost was 100 guineas and was therefore prohibitive for all but the very wealthy. John, um, and there was only, there was one copy. They completed their work in 1848. There was one copy known in the colony and that was owned by Charles Coxon. Do people know the name Charles Coxon? I'm sure the Birdos do. Uh, Coxon's fig parrot named for him. Uh, Charles Coxon also happened to be Elizabeth Gould's brother. So the brother-in-law of John Gould. So he owned one copy of the Gould Birds of Australia. Um, but he was also a good friend of Sylvester's. They were in the Queensland Philosophical Society together. Um, and so I think Sylvester was able to borrow the book and he was able to borrow skins of birds from Charles Coxon and so on. Charles Coxon went on to be um, a member of the Legislative Assembly, uh, one of the early politicians in Queensland. And this is the process of lithography. And you know what, I had no idea how you went ahead and did this. Um, it's thought that probably Sylvester learned this when he was at the Liverpool Mechanics Institute. And this was how he created his draw, well, his prints of the birds. And you know, if you want to know something, you go to YouTube. So, so this last week I thought, oh, I'll find out what this litho lithography is all about. So I went to YouTube and I found out how you do it. I knew it had something to do with stones, rocks. And apparently it has to do with um, marble, you use marble. Okay, so this was an important process that Sylvester already possessed and through which he was able to do all his printing of birds. So Sylvester decided that he was going to create a comprehensive work on the birds of Australia. Fancy coming up with that as a project. Um, he, it was going to be issued at 10 shillings per edition and it would come out in parts, and each part would illustrate six birds, initially drawn and painted by Sylvester from collected specimens. So either they borrowed skins of birds, or they shot the birds and drew them, or they somehow or other he managed to achieve this wonderful accomplishment. Uh, and each bird would also have a page of accompanying notes regarding distribution, habits, nesting and so on. And in the pr prospectus of his work, Diggles writes, and this is his, his words, he desires to place within the power of all who wish to obtain it an accurate and useful book of reference at as low a cost as will allow it to be published in a creditable <coughs> manner. And he thanks his friends Charles Coxon, MLA, and Eli Waller was a good friend. He was a taxidermist in Brisbane who assisted by lending the bird skins and the stuffed specimens. So this is, this is Sylvester's book. Now this is the subscribers list. Um, and as you can see, it's a veritable who's who of early Brisbane. You'll see Governor Bowen, um, Justice Lutwich, Charles Lilly, the Zoological Society of London and the Parliamentary Libraries of Queensland and New South Wales. Now, I think I found that subscribers list on the internet, but George has got the real thing. Look what, look what he showed me today. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> so I was thrilled to bits to see that. <laughs> okay. It's funny what some people are thrilled by, isn't it? So, George, would it be that people would prepay for this? I think so. So they'd prepay their 10 shillings, he'd go ahead and do the job, 
and then present them with their six birds right. and then um, you know they'd prepay for the next six birds when they had the money. and that's how it worked so here are some inclusions in the book and you've got them all around you today this is George's over here do you want to talk about that one over there George that you um, yeah, this one are, here the top left hand one is the black rump black throated finch which was called it was called the needles finch back in history put it right up near your mouth George is it on yep is it on? <laughs> and uh, I you know it's not that good really I think they might have been taken from skins the ghoulians aren't particularly good but the uh, long tail finch in the middle and the masked finch on the bottom these were the start of my interest in finches when I was about four years old watching these and birds uh, up on the top there is the ones that I've actually inherited, which I had as favourites when I was a little, little boy. So yeah, that's how I started. Mm. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> uh, these are mine, by the way. Yeah, they're part. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were describing them. I'm the oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have been describing them. All right. I put the ground parrot up there because, George, you would love to see a ground parrot and you haven't seen one, have you? Gee, I've seen it twice, but, you know. <laughs> Three times, says Pete. I've heard them. The palm cockatoo. If you, if you have a look at the facsimile books out on the table out there, you'll see his delightful image of the palm cockatoo. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, I think there's just another, and I think my all-time favourite are the spinifex pigeons, aren't they, aren't they gorgeous? Uh, Major Mitchell, well we saw some Major Mitchells in your slides today, George. Um, this one here, that actually appears in the book um, that I have here, in Louis Piggott's book. I'll tell you about him later on. I think it says it's from the unpublished series and it this one is in the Mitchell Library. A lot of his um, work is now in the Mitchell Library in Sydney. Great. Yep, okay. So, uh, just going back to the 22, oh, I wanted to tell you that 22 parts, 22 parts in total were issued between 1866 and 1870. That's a lot of birds, isn't it? 22 parts times six. Um, and a handsomely bound copy of the first 15 parts was given by the Queensland Government to Queen Victoria's son, Prince Alfred, when he visited Queensland. I think they called it Birds of Queensland that time. I discovered that in the newspaper. Um, uh, so, but, but the sad thing about the ornithology, it was both his his triumph and his tragedy, because he actually completed five, uh, sorry, 325 plates, 325 of those lithographic plates uh, with an accompanying description, and he illustrated over 600 birds. But the tragedy was that there came a financial slump in the colony, and that caused the subscriber numbers to dwindle significantly and it made it impossible for him to continue to publish. And he tried to obtain financial backing from the government of the day. He wanted to put the books into Queensland, into schools. There weren't very many schools, of course, but he thought the government might fund that. But they weren't forthcoming with the money and he couldn't find money anywhere else from any private source. So uh, it, it was ruinous to continue, he said. So he lamented, he lamented in his diary, I had the materials to bring out as grand a work as any that ever issued from an Australian press. But it didn't happen, of course. And ironically, you know, if you wanted to buy one today, they're very rare indeed. And um, I found, two years ago, I found two volumes containing 126 hand-coloured plates bound in green Morocco. It was available in Melbourne at the time for $25,000. But I can't find any books for sale now, so I guess they come and go. But you can buy prints like these for much less than that, from an antiquarium print. 
dealer. But we did ask when we were in Melbourne, we said, well, so is it easier to find a John Gould or a Sylvester Diggles? And the bloke said, oh, definitely, it's easier to find John Gould. There's far fewer Diggles, so they're rarer. Um, so now I wanted to say, well, where are the books now? Where are all these wonderful books? There's one here today, which is the family's book. A it's, one. it's a very tatty one because many grandchildren. Do you want to tell us about how you used well, to treat that book when you were a child, George? It was just a book to us. We just went, went to Grandma's place. They, she had them piled up on the floor. They were the ones that probably couldn't sell or didn't get around to selling. And um, we just leafed through them. That's a bird book. We just read it, you know. And, Consequently, it's looking pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where they are at the moment. A lot of them are in private collections, uh, are in, in both in Australia and around the world. Uh, they are in the Queensland Museum, and you can, if you want to see it, you can, um, you know, contact the museum and ask them to get it out for you, and they will. Uh, they're in the National Library of Australia in Canberra. In fact, I was just saying to George this morning when I was a very little girl and I was in Canberra with my mother and my mother pointed to something in the museum and said, look, that's your uncle's there. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, that's my uncle's. I guess everybody's got an uncle with something in the, you know, the National Museum in Canberra, I didn't know. But um, they're also in McGill University in Canada. All Hallows Girls School in Brisbane has a copy and the Mitchell Library in Sydney has a lot of his work. And uh, of course, the family have that one copy there. Yeah. So now I want to talk about this lady here. Her name is Rowena Burkett, and we need to acknowledge Rowena Burkett. So just harking back to Sylvester, uh, shortly after, only about three or four years after the family arrived in Australia, his first wife, Eliza, died. Uh, but the next year he married again to Albina Burkett and they went on to have two sons. And in 1872, Rowena Burkett, this lady here, sorry about the image, but that's the best that's available. Uh, she was an 11 year old girl and she came to live with her aunt Albina and her uncle Sylvester in Brisbane. And she became Sylvester's protege. She learnt to draw landscapes and birds and insects uh, and she eventually took on some of the hand colouring and especially after Sylvester became ill, uh, she took on colouring of his work. Now, when it became evident that he couldn't continue, he gathered together his materials, you know, his leftovers that he'd produced but uh, couldn't continue to sell. And he put them together in something called Companion to Ghoul's Handbook or the Synopsis of Birds of Australia. And that's what we're looking at here. And the reason that he did that was that apparently John Gould's work didn't always have an illustration of the bird, which made it a bit tricky if you're just going by a description. And not only that, it didn't actually have coloured images. So it was good to have the coloured images. And so there's a page with the accompanying notes beside it there. Um, and now I wanted to show you some of the papers on birds that he presented to the Queensland Philosophical Society and these ones are relevant to ornithology. And you can have a browse through those but you'll notice that he was always excited when some new birds came along. 1874, short notice of two birds new to Australian fauna. And down the bottom here, new and rare species of Australian birds. And Cecily, I think I was saying to you, look, the, the uh, Albert's lyre bird, and he spoke about, we were talking about this because Cecily's daughter is studying the Albert's lyre bird. Um, so now, apparently, as time went by, Sylvester had somewhat of an epiphany. He realised that it probably wasn't such a great thing to be shooting these birds in order to study them. This probably wasn't really a good thing. Remembering that, and you know this, that often they were shot or killed in order to study them. George, I put this in for you. Look, the rare ground parrot is commended as its flesh is an excellent flavour. <laughs> Well, they disappeared. Oh, but early, but that was early on. Now, by 1876, he's beginning to question 
the wanton killing of birds as a form of sport. And he's saying, the youth, this is his words here, the youth of this colony, instead of spending their leisure time in the useless and injurious and still often a cruel sport of shooting these beautiful creatures, will be led to study their habits and economy and thus become more useful auxiliaries in the study of natural history. And here he's actually plumping for the formation of the Queensland Museum. He wants to see a place to go, people can go and learn about the birds in a different way to what they've been used to. And this next slide I put together about two weeks ago, three weeks ago maybe. Why is, oh, why is Clive there? Well, you know, not everybody thinks that way, do they? And um, this, of course, is the black-throated finch, which was... The black rump version was the eagle's finch. Oh, have I That's got that wrong? The white rump. See, I'm not a birder. That's the seat duck. I've got the wrong one. <laughs> have a look at the one over there. It's got a black rump, now this one's got a white rump. Oh, okay. But that's okay. So when Clive was about to um, set up his Waratah coal project and, and obliterate the Bimble Box Nature Refuge, and people said, but hang on a minute, there's this rare and endangered bird living there. He said, well, fortunately, the black-throated finch has wings so it can fly. Yeah. It can go somewhere else. Yeah, when Sylvester was in Brisbane, these uh, white rump versions were all around Brisbane. Now they're rarer than the black rump versions because their habitat's been destroyed and mining and all the rest of it. Uh, this is the, the sinker and that's the rare one now. And then when I was a child and a young guy collecting birds, these were the ones that were available and the Diggles ones were rarer because they come from North Queensland. So it's turned right around. So did you keep those in your... I didn't actually, could afford them actually. Ah. I've had seen them in Avery's. But there's, there's heaps of them around there. Well, I'm going to have to change that slide, aren't I? Yeah, I might even delete paint, that slide. Just paint the rough black. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we've had the announcement about a Darnie now, haven't we? And that also it's in the same area. is in the same area. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that Sil Sylvester was a foundation member of the Queensland Philosophical Society. That was the state's first scientific body and it formed in 1859. Uh, so in 1862 the membership specifically directed its attention to the formation of a nucleus of a Museum of Natural Science in Brisbane. And they had displays, they had displays housed first of all in a building in the CBD, what we would now call the CBD. Um, and Charles Coxon is often generally regarded as the principal founder, but there were a small core working group who were working towards it. They were trying to decide where it would be best to site the museum. And Sylvester was saying, well, he thought it should be down near the Botanic Gardens and they could also put a, um, an herbarium there as well. They'd have the herbarium and the museum all near the Botanic Gardens, but ultimately it wasn't to be, um, and this, Oops, sorry. And this building, oh, go back. And this was the building that they created. But before that, the old windmill on Wickham Terrace was a place where they um, housed many of their displays, many of their collections. Um, it's a library now, isn't it? Yeah, well, it was. I think it's moved on now, yeah. So. What Sylvester writes in his own diary, he says he prepared and presented displays of insects, birds, oars, as in mineral oars, um, snakes and flints. And he wrote, the curatorship in great part devolves to me. So the debate raged, but eventually what happened was this building was created and Carl Steger was appointed as its first professional curator. But then the museum went on to have other homes. This one, the old museum buildings on Gregory Terrace. That's where you would have been, Cecily, right. as, as the first um, artist employed by the museum. And then of course, uh, 1986, it's moved over to the South Bank uh, in the Cultural Centre and that's where it still is. Um, so Sylvester was obviously very, very stressed about 
the fact that he couldn't get his book happening and he couldn't, you know, subscribers were falling away and he was going to be short of money and so on. And that saw his health decline considerably. Um, so he suffered a stroke in 1876. He was debilitated quite severely. And ultimately he died in March of 1880. He was aged 63. But in closing, I'd like to quote the late Sir Edward or Ned Williams. He's, he, he was a judge of the High Court. And uh, he wrote a letter to my cousin Irene, who, who was our family historian before me. Um, and in 19, 1990, this is what he observed. I offer the view that Sylvester Diggles made the most important contribution of any Queenslander to the advancement of culture in our fledgling state during its first 20 years. What he was trying to do there was to strike up a bit of a debate about that issue. He was hoping someone would write a book about Sylvester. He was hoping it would be Dr Elizabeth Marks who'd um, rekindled interest in Sylvester. But ultimately it wasn't um, her, it was actually Rod Fisher who wrote this one. Dr Rod Fisher, a, a Brisbane historian, he wrote this book, Diggles Down Under. He thought he was going to have the last say about Sylvester Diggles. Oh, it was a huge project and it's an amazing thing to read. I don't think you can get a hold of a copy nowadays, they're not available. But this one is available. Sorry, I'm going to just show you that slide. So Diggles Down Under, Dr Rod Fisher published in 2003. And then along came Dr Louis Piggott. I tried to find out about Dr Louis Piggott yesterday, but I... He was a dentist. He was a dentist, you thought. I don't know if he's still with us. Yeah, I think he is. This one is still available, The Birdman of Brisbane. You can buy this one through Bouleron Press. This one, whilst Diggles Down Under puts together all of the information from the diaries, from the sketchbooks, uh, etc., um, this one is more specific and it kind of looks at where are they now, where are the books now, whatever happened to them. Uh, why did it fail as a project and so on, if you, if you call it failed. I don't think it failed, it just, I don't know, ran out, of puff. ran out of puff. That's probably a good way to say it, George. So in closing, I'm just going to show you this one. When Pete and I went looking for Sylvester's house or where it had once been in Wharf Street um, in Kangaroo Point, we also discovered in the local park uh, several boards to the pioneers of Brisbane and Sylvester gets his own piece of info there. So you can find that um, in James Warner Park at Kangaroo Point. So he's honoured there, which is great, I think. Hmm. Isn't it gorgeous? So do you have any questions? That's the end. I thought I'd finish a little bit earlier because I want to... Um, give you an opportunity to have a look at all the stuff that that is around but if people have got questions before we do that I'm happy to give it a go. David did you have a question? No. No you were the light man. Oh thank you. So Alison might grab that. Thank you. So if anyone has a question Alison has the microphone. Just while you're thinking of questions to make the observation that uh, governments of Queensland um, have got a long history of not supplying money when it's needed. Nothing uh, 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 does change. What an extraordinary person. Mm, he was an extraordinary person, wasn't he? Uh, mm. I'm just overwhelmed, a little bit exhausted just hearing about it. And you haven't, haven't heard about the music. We have a question back there. <laughs> the music hasn't started. Hello, yes. This, I um, didn't hear you mention the Dioxity Library. Is it possible that they have nothing of like this? I haven't seen anything written about the John Oxley Library. Um, is that what? Does it have another name? Is it just like, called the Queensland Library? It's, it's an offshoot. It's, it's a heritage section of. I think they would definitely have. Yeah. Yeah. And you could, in fact, if you just ring ahead or email them, they will get the stuff out for you to have a look at. I have done that. Mm. Another one? Uh, this one wonders about his early education. He was 
Mm. Building and fire number of fields. Like music, for instance. Mm. How, what was his family background? Were they affluent or...? Uh, middle class, I think. Middle class? I think the mother, Elizabeth, I think she came from a bit of money. Um, I would say, and, and of course, they were right into the church, so attending church. Uh, it's thought that maybe he learnt to play the organ, piano, to tune those instruments through the church, perhaps before he, well, obviously before he left England, because that was a skill he had. Um, so middle class people working, uh, working in Liverpool. Hmm. Uh, it, side question then. Yep. Piano forte. Well, I think piano, it's a piano. Uh, it's just been shortened now to the word piano. It was piano forte before. Mm. Uh, about birds, if you shot one today, what, what would be the uh, consequences? Mm. Well, it would depend on if it was a protected... Are they all protected now? All yeah, all protected. protected. All Australian birds are protected species now. Yeah, yeah. My ancestor, my ancestor got seven years for shooting up Back? In England. Yeah. Oh, OK. And okay. the time out here with the government of Quarry looking after his horses. But, uh, oh, that wasn't so bad, was it? He must have been a terrific shot because they're on the fly, they go they see you, they're on the fly. You've got a shotgun. It's pretty sad, isn't it? When you think of how much we shot. It cost him seven years. Mm. But he came to Australia. Yeah. Well, that was a lucky thing. That's a lucky thing, I reckon. Yeah. That's why they want that second shot as a. Ah, oh, it's for those ground parrots because they're, they're so tasty. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have read uh, a book called Darwin Shooter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. So there's a few hands going up. And he talks about the number of birds that, that were shot during Darwin's trip around the world. Uh, just in order to have specimens yeah. to, to study, study yeah. but it wasn't a case of you know we'll just okay there's a that particular species of bird we'll shoot a male we'll shoot a female possibly a juvenile and we'll study those no it was like we'll fill the bag mm -hmm. and, and so they shot hundreds mm -hmm. in, in the name of uh, of, of science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was point, sure. It was pointed out earlier in one of the slides there that uh, they thought things were endless. Mm. There was so much. Mm. Those, Nobody know, gave it a thought. Absolutely. I thought it was fascinating that he was already thinking about these introduced plants and how they were beginning to overrun the place way back then. He was a man before his time. He was, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Information into the school. This, uh, this man is amazing. You know, if you think of what he put into that short life, and meanwhile travelling to Toowoomba on a boat to tune pianos, or oh no, no sorry, so, travelling to Ipswich, I meant to say, travelling to Ipswich, I meant to say, on the boat, and then the coach from there on. Sailing through Cunningham's Gap. Sailing through Cunningham's Gap. You said you went by boat to Yeah. No, no, and, and he imported pianos. Can you believe that? He imported them for people and took them on wagons and things out to Warwick and the like. But, oh, amazing. He was also instrumental in finding out the paradise parrot nested. That's in right, he was, wasn't he? Yes. That's an important thing. What was that? The paradise parrot nested in termites' nest, and mm -hmm. Sylvester was the one who pointed that out. But it was too late to save them because they kept knocking them down to make tennis courts out of them. That is right. Mm -hmm. We call them grass parrots. No, not, not green parrots, grass parrots. They live in the grass. They get their seeds from the grass. And, they, and this is a true story. We went to Mount Panorama one day, we and a few mates. You know, always, you all know where Mount Panorama is. That is. And we're going past this orchard. And we looked at them, there's apples like that, red, all beautiful. So we went up to the top of the Mount Panorama 
está en dedo apretado. Los caldeanos son los mejores. Recuerda muy bien. Big tree. Te queda un capa de pepo rojo. Just for that. And we dive into the tree. Do you know what? We got ripped to pieces with the parrots. There's parrots here everywhere. There was hundreds of them. And they came as hell like this. But we still got a few animals. And then I had to get out of a six foot fence to get out of the place. But I went back in about 20 years time and I bought a box and I told my lady, Mrs. Windsor, what we did. Back in the teeth, you mind it? Okay, I've heard of guard geese, I've never heard of guard parrots. No. Uh, that's one to keep in mind. Okay, well, look, we're right on time now. Uh, we'll give Cecily the last question. I think that would be appropriate. I'll just turn around and tell you about it. Because when I was working at the museum, I knew that this Diggles was one of the originals, but I didn't know anything about most of what you've said today. It's been wonderful hearing it all and knowing what went on. But um, it was also interesting when I was at the museum, and of course a very small uh, number of people on staff in those days, so you had to learn a tremendous amount. But that man really set the whole, the whole museum world in, 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 in Queensland. Mm -hmm. And so it's been delightful hearing about it. And although I helped you, and I also knew, um, um, oh, the entomologist. Elizabeth oh, Elizabeth Marks. Marks. Elizabeth Marks. Marks. Mm. Mm. She was an amazing person. Yeah, I, I too. met her too. Mm. She came yes. to. And, and her father, who was Dr. Marks, mm. on the terrace, you know, mm. up on Burn Terrace. And all those people. It, to me, this was a delight today. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it opened my eyes to many things which. I knew subconsciously, and meeting the two of them, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a real pleasure for all of us. What year did he die? 1880. Did he leave much of an estate after all of his pursuits? No, he didn't. No, and Albina Burkett was really, oh, well, sorry, she was Albina Diggles by then. Um, his wife really struggled to keep the family afloat. And some person in England said, I want you to send over all his drawings or a large portion of them. I'll sell them here so, or I'll publish them. I'll put them together in a book here. She did that and then she was swindled for that. She never got them back and the book never happened. So I think she really struggled after Sylvester um, died. Mm. Yes. Okay, so we do need to wrap up now. Uh, the material's still yes. here and, and please be careful what you touch. George well, George be will be there. Stick and an axe and cut off the hands of anybody. Ah. They should but I'd just like to say look, thanks very much to, to the two of you for assembling all this material, I guess particularly thanks to Liz for presenting it uh, in, in such a, an easily comprehended manner and, and opening our eyes to a person Someone you'd never heard of before. About. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank mm. you very, very much. And when you're putting chairs together, please don't bring them up for the moment. Just leave, you know, stack them up there and wait until we've uh, removed these materials here sort it out later okay thank you very much i hope you uh, visitors have enjoyed themselves here today and hope we'll see you again and welcome everybody thank you.